Thank you to Ting for sponsoring this video. Welcome to Samsung Galaxy Unpack. Welcome to the launch of something we know you've all been eagerly waiting for. Good morning and welcome to the Steve Jobs Theater. So with new phones seemingly coming out every few weeks, there's still one device annually that I get really excited about almost more than any others, and that's the Pixel line. I love to see what Google's going to do next, and that's no exception with the Pixel 5. If you start seeing rumors of what this phone is going to be, if only start to shape up, there's a lot to be excited about. And I thought sort of in that vein, it'd be a really good time to look back at the Pixel 4 and Pixel 4 XL and do our final review. The Pixel line has never been a universally loved, beautiful designed line of phones. In a lot of ways, it's function over form. And I think there's still a lot of beauty in that. And kind of in that vein, I've enjoyed the utilitarian aesthetic of the Pixel 4 XL. I've really grown to appreciate the function of what it can do. And the giant forehead hasn't really bothered me. I look at it the same way I look at the notch on the iPhone. At least it's there for a reason. It's enabling really good face unlocking. And that was actually the reason that I wanted to switch to the 4XL as my first phone when I made that Android switch. Uh, I wanted to have that really fast face unlock. And when the phone first came out, there was a bit of a problem with it. It would unlock with your eyes closed. Unfortunately, due to the beauty of software updates, Google has fixed that, and that's no longer an issue. And what you're left with is one of the quickest and most secure facial unlocking systems going. So one big knock on pre-Pixel 4 phones was the screen. And I think Google stepped up their game tremendously with the 4 and the 4XL. So we've got OLED here. We've got a 90 hertz refresh rate, all things that are really awesome. And if you think of the modern smartphone screen, I think most people tend to think of Samsung screens and OnePlus screens that are really poppy and bright, vibrant colors. Uh, the Pixel screens are not that. They are much more muted, less bright, and a lot of folks like that look. Maybe I've gotten used to the poppy colors and that's kind of been what my eyes tend to gravitate towards. The time that the phone came out, 90 hertz was awesome. I couldn't believe Google did that. That was amazing to have, but now in the area of really regular 120 hertz and having variable refresh rates, it's weird to say, but starting to show its age. The big knock that I have on the screen is still the same one that I had initial review. The brightness, it does not get that bright. But it's not to say it's a bad screen. It's actually a very different screen than a lot of the modern smartphones. And I say modern phones have come out in the past seven months. So initial review, I talked a lot about Project Solly. It's the radar features that were on the phone. And how I hoped that over time, software updates would enable new things. And in some ways they have. What you get is the radar helping that fast face unlock, which I really liked. And you can play and pause music here. You can swipe to the next song. But beyond that, I essentially forgot that it was here. I can see Google very easily for the Pixel 5 kind of Google plusing it and axing it in the favor of cost uh, for the next gen phone. I guess it was a cool case study, but I don't think it's anything that anybody really needed to have or was buying a Pixel 4 to have that feature. There are two things I think you have to talk about when it comes to the Pixel line of phones. Cameras and, and battery life. And let's start here with battery life. When I first started testing the Pixel 4, it was really bad. The Pixel 4 did not get any better at all. In fact, there have been reports that executives knew the Pixel 4 battery was not going to be very good and have since left the company. And it was mind blowing. They added so many new things from the three to the four. You've got radar, face unlock, 90 hertz refresh rate, and they put in a smaller milliamp hour battery than the Pixel 3. That was a recipe for failure. But switching gears from the 4 to the XL, it's a bit of a different story. It's not like battery king. It's not gonna win battery of the year awards and say it's a four day phone, but you can get through a full day. And I think that is sort of the barrier to entry to making a phone be easy to recommend. I could get through a full day on the 4XL. <laughs> So like the Pixel line and, and cameras are at this point synonymous. Like most people who are buying a Pixel, either doing it for software, for the amazing cameras. And it used to be that the Pixel was the best still camera you could get in a phone. And it's still now amongst the best. And it's not to say that it's not good, just that they set the bar so high. The competition actually, I think in a lot of ways caught up to what Google was doing. But having said that, 
pretty much any still picture in any setup that you do with the 4 or the 4XL is going to be some version of really good. It still amazes me how incredible the machine learning is with portrait mode, for example. They always look amazing. Night Sight looks like magic has happened to bring dark images to life with really not that much noise. Astrophotography, well, something I don't use all that often, it's really good to have there. Just every shot I take, I have confidence knowing it's going to be good. Video though, is still very much a different story. This is something that I talked about in the initial review. Hardware wise, it's still very capable of shooting 4K60, but Google's not allowing it. And that's fine, you don't have to shoot 4K60, but the video that comes out of it is still not great. And I can share an example of how it kind of impacted me. When I went to San Francisco for the Galaxy S20 pre-brief, where I could see the phones, a lot of the B-roll that I shoot is usually with the phone I have on me at the time when I was using the Pixel 4 XL. I didn't trust the video coming out of it to be good enough for the quality that I wanted for YouTube. So I had to bring another device with me, which video I thought was better. Now it's not bad video. I don't want that to be misinterpreted, but it's certainly mid to lower tier for what you can get with new Android devices. I don't want to harp on video too much. If your use case is Instagram or shooting videos upload to Twitter or even YouTube, it's still decent enough. And the whole camera system, sort of still and video combined, is amazing on this phone. And what this can do is still making me even more excited for what's gonna come next with the 5. While the competition is still very fierce in the optic world, and Google is still definitely keeping pace with them, but it's very clear the areas need to improve as we've seen the change in the past seven months in the smartphone landscape since the 4 came out. So as you guys are inevitably stuck at home or maybe starting to venture out and looking for ways to save money, I think one of the best ways to save a few bucks is on your cell phone bill and plan. And that's where something like Ting comes into play. You pay for what you're using. You can pick and choose the amount of data and text that's right for you. So a couple awesome things, if you're on a family plan, the more devices you bring over to Ting, the, the cheaper it gets. And obviously there are no contracts there either. So Ting isn't a, a prepaid cell phone service. You actually pay at the end of the month for what you're using. So you're not paying for data and features that you didn't use that month. And your cell service isn't gonna change. It works with the best networks. It'll work on Verizon's network, T-Mobile, Sprint's. You're always going to have service. The only thing that's really gonna change is your bill. And if you're looking to save as much money as possible, you can actually get a plan for like in the $20. You don't need a special phone or anything to work on Ting. Pretty much any smartphone will work, but they've got a checker to make sure your device is compatible there. And you sign up, they send you a SIM card, you pop it in and you are good to go. They make it really easy to port your number. All that really changes is what you're paying per month. So I challenge you to give it a shot. Go to john.ting.com. If you decide to sign up, we give you $25 of credit. So that's gonna equal out to like almost a full month of free cell phone bill, depending on how you configure it. It's awesome. I've used it personally as a way to save some money and it's a great way for you if you're looking to serve, obviously keep your cell phone working as you're used to, but not pay for things that you're just straight up not using. Maybe one of the most underrated things about the Pixel line is, is software. Getting a phone that you know is going to be supported with updates for three years is awesome. And those monthly updates come pretty close to the first of the month that you can count on it. You can count on new features and new things coming to the phone. That software peace of mind is really nice. And over there, updates are a huge benefit of modern smartphones. So you're always getting, at least amongst the best, of what Android can offer. And that's really a nice peace of mind to have. I like the software experience. I like what Google is doing. And there's still some disappointments on the software front. I kind of bummed out that they got rid of unlimited backups of original file size for photos. That was something that was really cool that offered in the Pixel line. So that negative is, I think, more than balanced out by some of the awesome positive stuff. On device, real-time transcription is really useful and helpful. And I find myself going back to the Pixel as I'm testing a new phone and just dictating notes to make sure I include in a review. I really liked having that on here. And another, perhaps the most underrated feature on any phone, it's not unique to just the Pixel anymore, uh, but the call screening feature, that still seems like magic and has saved me a lot of kind of robots telling me that they are calling from IRS and I am late in taxes. 
So on the whole, not much has changed on the 4 and the 4XL. The stuff that was good back then is still really good. And the stuff that was frustrating and I was hoping would get improved still really hasn't improved that much. But I think the big question now with the four line, so the regular and the XL, is right now, should you buy it? And you're at a starting price point of $800, at least retail, for the four. And as good as the four is, I don't think that should be a phone anybody should buy do just a battery life. So now you're looking at a starting price point of $900 for the XL with an insanely anemic 64 gigabytes of storage. At that price point, it's hard to recommend any of the Pixel lineup, but we don't live in an MSRP world. There are insane deals to be had on even the 4 and the 4XL, dropping the price down in some instances to around $500 to $550. At that price point, it is an absolutely incredible buy to get, and you're gonna get a very, very capable phone. But kind of holding over this phone's head is the imminent release of the 4A. Now we don't know battery capacity or if the 4A is gonna come with a 4A XL brother, but the 4A has been leaked all over the place. There are hands-on videos and billboards of this phone. And if we use what the 3A was as sort of a marker, you're gonna get the best of what the 4 line has to offer. So that's really camera software experience. And that should filter down to a starting price point of around 350 bucks. So then it's gonna come out to you what's worth it and not worth it. So if you decide that you're in the Android camp or you wanna be in the Android camp and you're willing to spend that top tier money for a Pixel phone, your best bet still though is probably gonna wait a few months for that Pixel 5. So now as we're looking back seven-ish months later, it hasn't been a disappointing phone. It has certainly not been a perfect experience, but Google in a lot of ways delivered on that initial Pixel promise with the 4. There are flaws and areas to be improved on, but I still really enjoyed using the phone. And it was a really good experience for me and my use cases. I think if you can take that experience away and view the flaws with maybe a little bit of distance, what Google delivered is still a really capable, really good series of devices.